God, it's going to be a short sermon this morning. It has to be. We've got some time constrictions and, and restrictions. Am I too loud? No. no. Okay. All right, then. It must be me. Okay. Um, we turn to the Word of God this morning, and we come to our, the theme of our 26th an anniversary, which is Revive Us Again. Do you remember the theme of the 20th anniversary? We'll keep it on this for a little bit. Do you remember? <coughs> remember? Rejoice. Rejoice. Rededicate. 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 Remember that one? And all you have to do is look at... Uh, hang on just a minute. All you have to do is look at... There we go. Do you remember? Rejoice. Rededicate. Those are, those are still hanging on, aren't they? So remember, Rejoice, Rededicate. That was in 2011, our 20th anniversary. How about 25th? That was last year. It was another three words again. FFF, find, follow, fulfill. Okay. You know when we think about the 20th anniversary and then when we look at, think about the 25th anniversary, uh, those two themes were a lot more uh, encouraging, weren't they, than then it seems to that then it seems the 26th is the 26th is revive us again it sounds like something's wrong doesn't it <laughs> well we remembered we rejoiced and we rededicated we find we followed and we fulfilled and here we are in the 26th and it's like revive us again but we come to this as we come to the word of god this morning and as your pastors we know that this is what god has put on our hearts for all of us together as a church and for us individually as well as Christians. And I want to ask you something. When you hear the word revive, what comes to mind? Think for it just a minute. To revive. I, I think of somebody lying somewhere. Maybe their heart has stopped beating. And, and uh, somebody who knows CPR or something like that is standing over them. And they're pumping their chest. And they're trying to hold their nose and do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And actually, that is, uh, that's actually a pretty, good, that's, that's a pretty good way of thinking about it. Because the word revive simply means to live again or to be renewed in life to live again or to be renewed in life. And so our theme this morning comes from the verse that we believe God gave us as a church, and it comes from Psalm 85, verse 6. So let's look at it. Shall we read it together this morning? Won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you? Won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you? And this is from the Psalms. But David did not write this psalm. This psalm was, it's Psalm 85, and if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at some of the verses, but if, you, if you're looking on your U version or you have a printed Bible as well, you're welcome to turn to Psalm 85. And as we look at it, I want us to look at Psalm 85 for just a little bit to understand how meaningful revive us again. Uh, won't you revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? how meaningful this verse is for us this morning as we consider the theme that God has given us and as we remember his faithfulness to us. Because as I said, David didn't write this psalm. David wrote many of them and they were collected. Most Bible scholars believe that this psalm was written, psalm or song. Psalm is the old, old way of saying it. If you wanted to today, you could just say song. And for, for the Jews, most of their prayers were written as many of them anyhow, they were written as songs. And so sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes for me when I'm praying, sometimes I'll sing to the Lord or I'll, I'll sing a prayer to Him. And often as we, as we worship the Lord, um, as we did this morning, do you know that that rises your worship to the Lord as we sing from our hearts and as we call out to Him and as we ask Him and plead with Him, as we honor Him? Those are prayers in song. We are doing very, in a modern way, in a very contemporary way, what we did this morning, what was done in Old Testament times and even in New Testament times as well. And so this is a song that was written. And it was written long after David was dead and gone. It was written long after the nation had walked away from God 
They had divided. They had broken into the northern kingdoms and then in the, to the two southern kingdoms. of, uh, and, and so all of these things had gone on. And most, most Bible scholars believe this was written after the nation of Israel had been taken captive, had been taken to Babylon. Some of you are saying, what? What about that? Let's talk about it. Some of us know it very well. What was the story of the exile? Most Bible scholars believe Psalm 85, including this verse, won't you revive us again so that your people might rejoice in you, was written after the exile, after Babylon, after the, after the nation of Israel had come back. So what was the story of the exile? I want to say to you this morning that the story of the exile of the Jewish nation, I think, reminds some of us of our own lives as well, doesn't it? It was written about the nation of Israel that had begun to turn away from God, not all at once, but step by step, gradually, gradually, they had grown careless. They had looked at the nations around them and they had started to desire what the nations around them had and were like and the way they did things. And over time, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, had begun to lose their relationship and the freshness of their life-giving relationship with God because they had chosen other things that were not of God. Now, I don't know about you, but that reminds me of my life at times, and maybe it reminds you of your life as well. And God, in love, because he wanted a relationship with them, had very gently talked to his people. Very gently he had called them. He had sent prophets to lead them in, to lead the people in his ways. And over time, the people had neglected the prophets. They had stoned some of the prophets. They had rejected them. They'd wanted to kill them. And they turned more and more away from God and from the only relationship that would give them life, the only relationship that would give them life. And then God, still in love, when his gentle ways would not turn their hearts back to him, he allowed their choices to bring their consequences. That sounds like us sometimes too, doesn't it? And he, when the gentle and the soft ways would not turn their hearts, he allowed the hard things to enter their lives so that perhaps those hard things might turn their hearts back to God and the only relationship that would ever give them life. That give them life. And in that process, the children of Israel were overrun. They were defeated by the Babylonian army. They were taken more than a thousand kilometers away. The temple was burned, was looted and burned. They were taken away from their homeland. They were not allowed to speak their mother tongue. They were not allowed to worship the one true God. When they had a choice, they had decided this is not the God we want to worship. And God allowed them to enter into a time where they didn't have a choice any longer and they were no longer allowed to worship the Lord publicly. And so it became a relationship and a religion of the heart for those who would say, oh God, I'm in a foreign land. Oh God, I'm not allowed to worship you. Oh God, there's no temple where I can go to seek you anymore. But oh God, my heart wants you. And God began to work in the heart of his people. And after 70 years, God took the heart of a pagan king, not even a king who loved God. Wow, that tells us that God can use anybody, anything, anywhere, anytime. He really can. And this pagan king who didn't love God, who didn't follow God, allowed God's people to return to Israel. And in returning to Israel, he kept them safe on the trip back to Jerusalem. He helped them and enabled them to rebuild the temple again. He allowed the nation to be rebuilt. Wow, the blessing of God. He allowed the liturgy or the worship of God. The priests were established again and the worship of God, the public worship of God was reestablished and they would gather every Sabbath day and they had an altar where they would have their, where they would have the sacrifices according to the law. So all of this was given again. All of this God allowed again. Now look at the next passage. This is in verse 
6, but look at verses 1 through 3. And verses 1 through 3 tell us a little bit, and they give us a hint of what we just talked about. Look at what it says. The writer says, Lord, you poured blessings on your land. You showed favor. You restored the fortunes of Israel. You forgave the guilt of your people. Yes, you covered all their sins. You set aside all your fury and turned away from your fierce anger. So, brothers and sisters, if this psalm was written after all of that had occurred, then it's truly a wonderful song for us this morning, for that time and for us as well, even more and more meaningful. Because what we see is this. When you look at this and when you consider this, what you see is the blessing of God externally on the people of God, right? He had brought them back from captivity. They had been prisoners of war. Has anybody been a prisoner of war here before? I don't think so. Nobody here has been a prisoner of war. But to use modern terms instead of the word exile, they were prisoners of war. He had saved them from that. He brought them back to their own land. They had their nation again. They had the temple rebuilt again. They had all of the worship and all of the laws again. But changed circumstances was, were those changed circumstances, they were not enough. Why weren't they enough? Because changed circumstances and good circumstances and blessings of God in our lives in these temporal things and these earthly things are not enough to give life to the heart. They're good things. We like them. Aren't you glad when you have a good job and you thank God for it? Yes? yes. Those of you that have, uh, those of us that, that uh, those of you that are, are uh, domestic helpers here this morning, don't you hate it when you have a really tough work situation and you're just counting the days till the end of your two-year contract, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to, and you're going to try to find another employer. But don't you praise the Lord when you have a generous employer, a kind-hearted employer, and, and you thank the Lord for that blessing. Or those of us that are working in other types of jobs, and you thank the Lord when, oh, Oh, the pressure is lifted for a while and it's a time of ease and you're able to do the work that God that you feel God has called you to do we're glad for that or times in our lives when God brings good health or God provides all the finances that we need or we have a great church that we're part of these are all good things brothers and sisters but just as those good things were not enough to give life to the heart for the children of Israel, for you and for me here in 2017, all of these external things are not enough. They're not enough. And so the children of Israel, in the midst of the blessing of God and the favor of God, prayed this prayer that is a prayer for you and for me this morning. Oh God, won't you revive your people again that we may rejoice in you. And so our challenge this morning, here in 2017, God has given us a good year this past year. He has. He has. When we reached a financial crisis last year, we talked about it in November, and we presented it to you, and you gave generously, and God is 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 as we give and as we obey, God has been strengthening us in that area. The church has been, has been renovated, the outside of the building, all of these things. They're good things and they're nice things. But brothers and sisters, they're not enough because these are temporary things and these are temporal things. And you and I still need a cry from our hearts, every one of us, every one of us. Oh God, won't you revive me again that I may rejoice in you? And I believe that's why God has put this prayer and this theme on our heart for 2017. Because it takes more than good circumstances to revive our hearts, to revive our lives. It takes an ongoing and a fresh relationship from God himself. Only God can revive. Church can't revive now we can gather together with the fellowship of others, but church can't do it. Church is not enough. It has to be God. It has to be God. And you know, we can read 
from all the way from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, and the story and the truth is always the same. Life comes from God and only from God. We can be happy for a while. We can be content for a while with all of these other things. We can have a good job and a good situation, and we can feel better for a while. But these things cannot revive us. Only God revives us. Good religion may make us feel better for a while, but religion cannot give us life. Only God revives us. We can light candles. We can say prayers. We can give offerings. But only God revives us. Only God gives us life. And I'm reminded, we're looking at the Old Testament, but I'm reminded of something that took place in the life of Jesus that fits very well with what we're talking about this morning. And it's, in recor it's recorded in, gospel, in the Gospel of John, chapter 7. So let's look at that. And this is, about, this is um, something that took place. It was the great feast of the Jews. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. And during this time, it was a seven or you say, oh, are we going to talk about things like that? Yeah, just very briefly, we're going to talk about that because it helps, to, it helps to refresh this and make it real for us as well. It's not just an Old Testament thing that we see. It's New Testament as well. And it's recorded in John chapter 7 that Jesus was in Jerusalem for this feast. And as he was in Jerusalem, he was watching what was going on. He was in the temple in the temple area the feast lasted seven or eight days the bible doesn't tell us exactly was this the seventh day or the eighth day but anyhow it was the end of the feast and let's look what it says jesus is watching them and if you don't know very well about what is going on and why this is this is significant let me tell you what would go, what was going on during this feast, which was the greatest feast of the Jews that lasted for seven days, seven or eight days, every day the priests would take a golden pitcher, and you've heard me talk about this before, some of you, and they would go to the pool of Siloam, which was outside the gates, and they would get a pitcher full of water. And then they would come back, and then in the presence of all the people, they would take this pitcher and they would pour it out in front of all of the people. And the people would rejoice and they'd glorify God. And it was done symbolically to remind the children of Israel of all those years in the wilderness when God had been faithful to them and when he had provided water from the rock. We remember that, right? As they wa wa uh, wandered in the wilderness more than on, on more than one occasion. And they knew that the water was miraculous and the water that had come from the rock had saved them physically, okay? It saved them physically because they were wandering the wilderness and if they didn't have water, they were going to die. And so as they poured out this water, it reminded the people of what God had done every day. And the people would, oh, they'd shout and they rejoice at this symbolic religious ritual. And it was a true thing and God had really done it. And the other thing that, it was, that was symbolic about this was it reminded them of some of the prophecies that had been given that one day the Messiah, ooh, I get chill bumps when I think of this, that one day the Messiah would come and when the Messiah came, he would restore Israel. He would bring hope and joy and life to Israel. And every day of the feast, he would gather, he would, they would get the water, they would walk back, and everybody would be watching, and then they would pour the water out, and the water would flow on the ground, and it would go to the altar, all the way around the altar where the, where the sacrifices were, okay? And they would rejoice, and they would cheer, and it was a loud thing. Jesus was part of this group. And I want you to think for a minute what must have been going on in the mind of Jesus those seven days as he saw this symbolic ritual take place. And all of the people were focused on the symbolic ritual, this religious ritual that was part of what they were doing. And oh, and they were thinking about it, and they were all excited about this ritual until the last day of the feast. And Jesus couldn't stand it anymore. And he stood up and he burst out. Now here, it says he cried out, but what it means to use a modern term is he shouted. And he really, really shouted. Uh, this morning when Panina gave a shout of joy, it got everybody's attention, didn't it? 
the kids that were sitting on the front, Kingsley and Noah, they were like, <gasps> like, that, like that. It was a shout of joy, and it got everybody's attention, and it was praise to the Lord. Well, Jesus stood and shouted also and got their attention. And what did he say? It reminds us of the verse that we've just read in Psalm 85, verse 6. He stood up and he cried out, If anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. Why did Jesus cry out? We know why Jesus cried out, don't we? Here was Jesus, the one who was not symbolic, the one who was not as water poured out. He was the water of life himself, and he was in their midst, and he was there if they would but turn to him, if they would but acknowledge, if they would but see that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the one who had come to save. He was the one who truly could satisfy the thirsty heart. And he said, oh, if you're thirsty, he couldn't stand it anymore. In the midst of all the religious ritual, come to me, come to me and drink. And brothers and sisters, I grieve for us at times. And I'm that way too. We're all that way. We sometimes get busy with church, don't we? We get busy with religious activity. Is it good, religious activity? It's good. There's nothing wrong with it. We get busy with, now I've got to come to church on Sunday morning, and we should because the Bible says don't give up meeting together. You should be meeting together. We get busy with serving the church or using our gifts or all of these things that are part of the church. And over time, if we're careless and if we're not careful about it, we can look at those people long ago and say, how could they not see that Jesus, the living water, was there? And yet, brothers and sisters, we ourselves can fall into the same trap. Can we not? Can we not? We can. We get busy. We get tired. We get upset with somebody in church. We get offended by somebody that has said something to us. And our hearts fill up with these things. And when our hearts fill up with these things, and when we allow feelings in that all oh, have nothing to do with our beautiful, tender, gentle Jesus, these things happen. These things happen. Do we choose? I, 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 don't, always, I don't always know. I, I, I have met very few, I don't know if I've ever, ever met anyone who was following God and had a good relation, relationship with him and then suddenly and immediately said, God, I don't want you anymore. I'm going to walk my own way. I'm going to go into the, I'm going to choose my own way. I, I've met, I don't know that I've met anybody like that. But I've met plenty of Christians and I think we could all include ourselves in this at times that have maybe grown complacent. Everything's going well. Things are great. Yeah, praise the Lord. And we get complacent and we stop paying attention to that fresh relationship with God, the only relationship that is life-giving, the only relationship that is life-giving. Or we get careless, right? Sometimes we get careless. We're, we're busy and we neglect. And we get to the place where, just like the children of Israel, not seeing Jesus that morning, or like the children of Israel wandering through the desert and needing water, we find ourselves, pastors included, workers included, Bible teachers included, worship leaders and backups included, cleaners included, translators included, tech team included, Sunday school teacher included, all of us included. We, we find ourselves at the place where sometimes we just feel kind of dead, don't we? There's not much fresh in our lives, isn't there? Does that describe you or am I just describing me this morning? We all get there, don't we? I've never met a person, I've never met a Christian who has not needed at some time in his or her life to pray the prayer, Oh Lord, won't you revive me again? that I might rejoice in you. 
as I was praying and meditating, and our time is really short this morning, I told you it was going to be short, but stay with me as we come to a conclusion this morning. As I was praying each day, and I'd asked you last, last Sunday, pray each day this prayer, revive us again, meditate on it. The Lord reminded me of, of, of something. Um, Sarah, go to slide, I think it's slide, uh, slide five, isn't it? The Lord reminded me of something. This is my balcony out where I live, ah, way out in the middle of Kaolong Hong with the mountains behind me. I love plants. I love plants. And I have all sorts of plants on my balcony. I have more on the roof. I cleaned it up for the pictures so it would look a little bit better. But oh, I just, I love plants. I love all sorts of plants. I like succulents, especially the ones that don't take a lot of water. Uh, I've rescued orchids. You can't see them there, but orchids from the church, you know, after a while when the flowers of blooms are gone, I rescue them. And I, and I have some, some are given to me, some I rescue, some I buy. Um, I've got uh, euphorbia down there. I've got vinca. I've got pitcher plants. Some of you are saying, what in the world? world are you talking about? <laughs> but those of you that love plants, you know what I'm talking about. All of these plants. And the Holy Spirit reminded me this week, really, about uh, specifically about this as I was praying about Revive Us Again. I love my plants, but I have one big, big problem. I am not very consistent with watering my plants. <laughs> it's true. I'm so sorry. And so here on the balcony with the glass around it, um, especially on the days when it's really hot and the sun comes through, the glass sort of magnifies the, the, the rays of the sun and it gets really hot there and the plants really dry out. And I'll come in from a long day at work and sometimes I, I here at the church and sometimes I just forget about them. I really do. I come in and maybe it's been really hot and maybe two or three days or four days pass and I haven't watered my plants. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> or I come in and it's already dark and I'm really tired and I know I need to water them. And I think, hey, I'll water them tomorrow morning. I'm really tired. It's nighttime. They'll be okay, you know, at nighttime. And they get up in the morning and I pull back the curtains and I look on the balcony and my poor plants look as if they're dead. <laughs> they really do. They, they're completely, the, 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 the soil in the pot is all dried up. The plant will be, instead of like this, the plant will be completely over like this. And I will think, I've done it. That's it. They're gone. Plants are dead. That's it. And this happens even though I have four. Four watering containers. I have four watering containers, but it doesn't, uh, it's a little bit like us. We may have 27 Bibles, but if we're not reading it, it doesn't do us any good, right? <laughs> That's not the main application here this morning. But, so even though I have four watering things, I, I still, I just get busy and I get careless or I get complacent because maybe it's raining and when it's raining, sometimes I'm so happy. It's like, it's raining. I don't have to water my plants <laughs> because the, especially when there's a typhoon because the wind blows and the water comes on the plants. <laughs> But the main point of it is this. I look in horror, I've killed my plants. Now don't make, I don't want you to make all the spiritual applications here because we can't be careless about our Christian lives. But this is specifically the point the Holy Spirit reminded me of. I see my plants, they're wilted, and I run out and I grab one of those four containers and I go fill it up with water. And then I pour water on them all the way up and down, all the way up and down. Then maybe I go back and I pour a little bit more. And it's kind of like a miracle. Literally, about 15 minutes later, I look out on the balcony and those plants that were like this are, they're right back up, they're, they're right back up again. They're right back up again. Now, that doesn't mean that's how we can do it with our Christian lives, but the point is this, in the natural, and this is what I think the Holy Spirit was reminding me of. Just as water revives those plants that look like they're dead, Oh, brothers and sisters, the water of God revives us as well. It really, it truly, it really, really does. And that's, that's the simple example that he gave me. And that's why Jesus cried. He says, if you're thirsty, come to me and I'll give you, I'll give you water. Uh, slide six, and we've got to stop. And we've got to stop. Um, and so we're not going to get to the end of the other ones. That's okay. We're going to end with this. Just a reminder of this. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3. Here, this one is a psalm of David, the good shepherd, who says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. 
and restores another picture for revive. He restores my soul. Brothers and sisters, he's our good shepherd. He's our good shepherd. And he leads us in ways, if we will let him, if we will be led by him, if we will be led by him, he will lead us into ways where our souls are restro restored, where we are revived, that we might rejoice in him. And so we're going to pray very simply this morning as we close. We're gonna, it's, it'll be time to go to the hotel. In just about three minutes, we're gonna, three or four minutes, we're gonna have to head out. But you know what? I don't know about you, but for me, I need the water of Jesus and the reviving of the Lord more than I need a buffet table full of delicious foods and delicious drinks. And I think the same is true for you. And so just very simply this morning, would you, if you're thirsty, would you ask the Lord, oh Lord, would you revive me again that I might rejoice in you? Just go ahead and close your eyes and just talk to the Lord. And I want to, as you pray and ask him, I want to especially encourage those of you who feel like your heart is really, really dry and really, really dead. Because I think some of us may feel that way. And this is not an accusation. It's just this is the way it is sometimes. Sometimes we get so dry that we really feel like, Mobamfa, uh, I can't do anything about it. I'm too dead, I'm too dry. Be reminded of those plants on my balcony that I looked at and I thought, well, I've killed them for sure. They're dead now and water, simple water poured on them, a few minutes later revived them. This is how the water of Jesus revives us as well. And so Jesus, we come to you very simply this morning. We come to you, Lord, wherever we are in you, whatever we do for you, whether we're new Christians or old Christians, Jesus, we want our prayer, and our prayer is this morning, the prayer of the children of Israel after the exile, and the call of the heart to you. Won't you revive us again that we might rejoice in you? Jesus, I'm really sorry that I've been complacent, that I've been careless, and that I've filled my heart with other things, and I've neglected the one thing in my life that will give me life, and it's relationship with you. Oh, Revive us, O oh Lord. Revive us, O oh Lord, that we might rejoice in you. And as we rejoice in you, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Won't you revive us again, O oh Lord? Father, I pray for this for us as a church, for Pastor Renee and for me as pastors of this church. Lord, even for us, it's easy to get busy doing your work and to get dry inside. Won't you revive us again that we might rejoice in you? Our hearts call out to you, O oh, our good shepherd, who will not let us be in want and who will lead us into green pastures and beside still waters so that our souls may be revived and restored. In your wonderful, life-giving name, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.